Good morning. So we are going to start the session. My name is Marcelo Amato. I'm going to chair the session. I have the pleasure to have a very three important speakers with whom I had uh, some, I have had some projects together and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Each one of them, it's an expert in an area that uh, composed this symposium. Basically, uh, they are some tools that we have in the ventilator, but for me, they are tools that we can use for lung protection. And I think uh, this is what wrap up this uh, symposium. So our first speaker is going to be Elias. Elias Bedoff uh, is from Harvard University in Boston. And uh, please, Elias. Thank you so much, yours. Marcelo. It's great to see everybody here today for this lunch. Um, um, so what I'm going to be uh, talking about today is uh, the use of adaptive support ventilation, um, a little bit of closed loop ventilation and sort of how I think about using this for uh, clinical care and particularly about lung protectiveness. Um, so just a little bit of background. So when we're thinking about closed loop systems, essentially what we're doing is we, we have these systems that read a signal from the patient and then automatically make an adjustment in response to that signal. And then it's this sort of constant back and forth between the ventilator making adjustments in, in response to the patient. And these are as simple as even a pressure regulated volume targeted mode of ventilation, right? Reading the signal of the tidal volume and then adjusting in, in response to that. Uh, closed loop ventilation systems though are, have really sort of progressed quite a bit. And so what, when we think about closed loop systems now, we think about really much more advanced the signals that the, these um, ventilators are able to detect and then in respond to make um, more complicated adjustments as well in response to oxygenation, in response to uh, uh, carbon dioxide clearance, um, the mechanics of the lungs, et cetera. And we are really entering an era of automation really kind of catching up with where the technology actually is right now and understanding how to provide really lung protective automation rather than just convenient lung um, uh, um, automation. And so what we're going to be talking about mostly today is um, a, a mode of, of ventilation that we use quite frequently in our ICUs, um, and this is the um, ASV, or Adaptive Support Ventilation. And um, when the ASV algorithm was first created, it was um, really uh, derived from the equation of motion using the, this classic Otis equation that we see here on the right. Um, and these, uh, this is a, obviously a very complicated equation, but there's a couple of key little variables in here that you can see. One is that what we're solving for is the, the frequency here, and then we also have some, several parameters, including the, the time constant as well. And what we're essentially doing is solving for the, the, um, the optimal breathing frequency in unassisted breathing is the Otis equation to solve for the uh, minimum uh, breathing effort, which is uh, also called the breathing power or the rate of muscular work, okay? And so what's important is that you can, that, that time constant variable that's in there is, is there for a number of reasons. And we'll get into that in a moment. But the, the time constant is a, is a really important but other, other probably underappreciated variable. Um, essentially, it's calculated by uh, the compliance times the resistance. Um, you can also you, uh, make some um, estimations of it, uh, assuming equal resistance throughout a breath by looking at the change in volume over change in flow. And different um, uh, time constants indicate different pathologies for a patient. So a very short time constant means that the air takes a very, very short amount of time to escape the lungs, and a very long time constant means that the air takes a very long time to escape the lungs. Um, and when we think about the time constant, you can, what's nice is that you can use the number of time constants to determine the, um, how long it takes for somebody to have a full exhalation. So usually it takes about three to four time constants to have 95 to 98% of your exhalation. And so, for example, if a patient with COPD who has a time constant of two seconds, it will take uh, at least six seconds to have a full exhalation. So you can see how this is uh, very useful when determining um, uh, how to prevent dynamic hyperinflation. And the way that the, um, that the ASV algorithm kind of determines things is through a number of different uh, parts. So one, you can see this green line here, and this is all the combinations of tidal volume and respiratory rate that achieve the set minute ventil ventilation that we're setting for a patient. Um, and then you, this little uh, circle here is what is determined by the, the ventilator as the optimal combination of these to minimize the, that, um, that, uh, that, that uh, work of breathing from the um, Otis equation. 
Um, you also have some safety parameters. You have a safety parameter to prevent barotrauma or overdistension, a safety parameter to prevent dynamic hyperinflation from a, a rate that's too high, a safety parameter to, to prevent dead space ventilation, and a, a safety parameter to, to prevent apnea as well. And so um, I'm not going to go through the, the, the evidence for this because, because I, when we first got uh, ASV, I think everyone kind of thought of this as a weaning mode. And when I say why it's a weaning mode, it's because there's numerous studies that have shown that this can pr the, um, expedite the process of weaning in both surgical and non-surgical patients. But my own personal interests were much more around the lung protectiveness of the mode itself, not so much the weaning, although the weaning obviously is important too. So that we're going to, I just wanted to show you that, that evidence very briefly, but not kind of go, go into too much detail. And so in the initial algorithm of ASV in all ventilated patients, this was from 2008, 243 patients, they looked at tidal volume and respiratory rate combinations, and they found um, uh, that there was a higher tidal volume and lower rate in COPD. And then in ALI, ARDS combination, they found a lower tidal volume and higher respiratory rate combination. But you can see that these are still slightly higher tidal volumes than we might otherwise want in a lung protective strategy for some patients in the ALI, ARDS group. Um, and when this was looked at, again, in two subsequent studies, um, in the first one on the left, 88 patients in three groups, normal lungs, restrictive disease, and obstructive disease, and they looked at the transition from, con from conventional to ASV. ASV lo lo resulted in lower inspiratory work, a slightly lower rest rate and higher tidal volume, and ASV was noted than, uh, versus um, conventional ventilation. Um, and then they noted that there was a lower tidal volume and restrictive disease. But they did note that there was three patients who had potentially unacceptably high tidal volumes in the obstructive group. And uh, on the right, you can see this was a, a group of 48 patients that were randomized to ASV or volume control. And they found that a similar duration to mechanical ventilation, mortality, ICU stay, but you can also note that there's a slightly higher tidal volume in the, um, in the ASV group. Um, and so this is important because it led to a reconsideration of the underlying algorithm that was used. And so um, there was an uh, additional algorithm that was, that was created, which actually used the equation of motion again, but solved for a little bit of a different um, uh, um, uh, derivation. And this was uh, based upon the Mead equation, that instead of solving for the work of breathing, it solved, solved for, for the, um, minimizing the force per breath. And by doing this, essentially what you are doing is minimizing the stress that's applied to the lungs or to the driving pressure. Um, and this was added to um, help support improved lung protection. Um, and so the evidence for this um, is sort of still growing, but um, here's a study from 26 pediatric cases. Uh, ASV 1.1 was compared, which is the new uh, updated mode with control mode, um, and then with uh, crossover. And they looked at uh, driving pressure um, and tidal volumes, and they found that driving pressure and tidal volumes were both lower in the ASV group. Um, of course, obviously, you know, you could argue that the control group maybe ha could have controlled their tidal volume more and, and actually lowered it art um, artificially for the comparison. Um, and so, um, so the, the data is, is intriguing, but also uh, slightly limited here, too. Um, and then in a uh, recent study from last year as well, um, uh, they, uh, this group looked at um, 24 patients, 12 consecutive patients in ASV and then 12 consecutive patients in pressure control. And they looked at the mechanical power comparisons between the two. Um, and they found that the um, conventional group had, a, um, on average, a higher mechanical power than the ASV group. And the mechanical power, just to clarify, even though um, the, uh, the Otis equation solves for minimal power, it's a bit of a different equation than, than actually is used for the, the, what we're thinking about in the literature now as mechanical power. So it was almost, it was almost serendipitous that the, um, that the initial equations actually solve for something similar with a similar idea, but a, a little bit of a different derivation and a different sort of meaning of the, of the word power here. Um, this was really interesting as well, but also uh, notably because it was 12 consecutive patients in each mode, there's no crossover, there's in lack of internal control, um, but it's certainly intriguing that this mode could, could potentially provide lung protectiveness in some patients. And so as, uh, as par in part of this interest, we did a, uh, a, a, a crossover study in patients with ARDS. We enrolled patients with Berlin criteria ARDS. And, um, and, uh, and specifically what we did is we, we set the tidal volume in the control group to six cc's per kilogram and then use that as the control to compare to the ASV group. And then we crossed, we, then we did randomization to inter, uh, order of intervention with crossover in between and looked at mechanics and uh, gas exchange, et cetera, after each um, uh, mode. And what's important is we found that the tidal volumes were actually uh, quite similar 
um, uh, um, between the CMV and the, um, and the ASV group, although there was a slightly higher tidal volume of 6.29 versus 6.04 in the ASV group when um, adjusted for ideal body weight. Um, and so we interrogated this a little bit more. We were curious, okay, so why is it that we had this slightly higher tidal volume, even though it's not clinically significant, we think this is clearly within lung protective um, values. And it, what emerged is very clear is that there's a much wider range of tidal volumes in the ASV group, ranging from very, very low, lo much more protective volumes up to slightly higher tidal volumes. And what, what's important, though, is that despite the, that range in tidal volumes, um, these patients still received um, normal driving pressures. And so the, what, I, what we can see here is this sort of range in tidal volumes based upon the patient's unique um, phenotype. And when I say unique phenotype in particular, I mean the stiffness of the lungs. So when you look at the um, correlation between the tidal volume and the compliance, there's a correlation between patients with stiffer lungs receiving lower tidal volume in both the adjusted and non-adjusted tidal volume, and then similarly with a time constant as well. And so this idea is that these patients with the stiffer lungs were the ones who achieved the, those um, uh, 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 more protective, potentially more protective uh, tidal volumes. Um, and then, the, you know, I think this is important because it really, the, this idea of 60 cc's per kilogram for everyone has really been challenged over the last um, uh, uh, several years. And this idea that tidal volumes probably need to be adjusted more for the patient's um, uh, mechanics rather than using a one-size-fits-all approach for the, the tidal volumes. And so here's a nice Bayesian analysis from, uh, from you in, in Toronto looking at um, uh, a number of ARDS studies that um, randomized to high and low uh, tidal volumes. And they found that the lowering the tidal volume really found, uh, provided the most benefit in the patients with the stiffest lungs. Uh, and the other suggestion from this is that patients with normal compliance may be um, tolerating higher tidal volumes as well. Um, in particular, uh, and you can still probably use driving pressure as a guide for that. And why this is important also is we found that the driving pressures were the same, um, although there was marginally lower tidal, uh, sorry, driving pressures in the ASV group, although it didn't meet st statistical significance. And we looked at transpulmonary uh, pressures as well using soft manometry and didn't find any difference in the pressures that were distending the lungs either. The mechanical power um, was compared between the two groups as well, and this was um, similar between ASV and CMV. We used mechanical power calculation of the gold standard as opposed to the, um, the simplified equation where we calculate the um, uh, area under the curve and then multiply this times the respiratory rate to calculate the, the power. Um, and we found then um, that actually the change between control mode to ASV was interesting because um, in the patients with stiffer lungs, this resulted in a uh, dropping of the mechanical power. And this was most likely secondary to uh, the lower tidal volumes that were decreased in that group um, with that change. And, and this is in agreement with um, some other newer studies as well, which, is, which have recently, recently came out. And so this is a, a retrospective study looking at 51 patients that were collected before and after conversion to um, Intellivent ASV. And Intellivent ASV is very similar to ASV um, in terms of how it determines the tidal volume rest rate combination. The main difference is the automation of some other factors like oxygenation and CO2 clearance. Um, but I include this because the, since the ASV algorithm is used for the determination of the tidal volumes itself. Um, uh, this can be important. And so the primary endpoints in this were driving pressure and tidal volume, and they found that, uh, that Intellivent ASV lower, delivered lower driving pressure and tidal volume um, uh, and, um, and lower uh, mechanical power as well for, um, for, the, for the patients. Obviously, this was a retrospective study with no um, uh, con control, but this was still um, intriguing in the fact the way it captured this change. And then uh, additionally, um, during the COVID pandemic, I think when all of us were grasping for ways of protecting ourselves, the idea of automated uh, modes, modes of ventilation really um, became exciting. Maybe this will uh, uh, allow us to have less direct exposure, especially in the first surges when we were really worried about the transmissibility and the concern for healthcare worker exposures. Um, the idea of having a closed loop system that can automate safe, protective settings for patients I think is really intriguing. And so this was a pragmatic study which basically looked at um, availability of the ventilators and then randomly allocated the ventilators based upon availability. And this uh, resulted in 23 patients receiving closed loop ventilation and 17 receiving conventional. And they found, looked at lung protectiveness based upon tidal volumes, driving pressure, peak pressures, oxygen saturation, and dynamic mechanical power. Um, and they found that the, that the, uh, the uh, closed loop group um, achieved lung protectiveness um, uh, with a greater percentage of, of the time compared to the conventional group, 65% versus 37%. So again, the, the, the takeaways from this are that 
Um, you know, most of the data for this is still relatively small. Um, but I think the, the data is certainly intriguing in the, in the fact that it's pretty consistently showing that when applied correctly, that these modes can, uh, um, can deliver uh, more individual, potentially more individualized tidal volumes that are within lung protective ranges um, and may lower uh, uh, driving pressure and tidal volumes, particularly in patients with stiffer lungs. Um, and um, there's this um, sort of early data about mechanical power with whether or not you believe in mechanical power as a concept or not, that's a whole other debate that which we won't go into today. But it certainly does seem to uh, potentially lower the energy delivery to um, the, the patient's lungs, um, uh, especially in those patients with the most sensitive lungs. Um, uh, the truth is that we need more research on this to determine whether these, physiolog these potential physiological effects and benefits may actually translate to more clinical outcomes benefits as well. Um, but I do think that the that individualized automated modes of mechanical ventilation really represent an important future for us. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Elias, uh, my, my, my first question is why you didn't have a more dramatic reduction in driving pressure. I was expecting this. And, uh, and then uh, you can tell me if uh, all ventilators now that by Hamilton, they have this new formula? Okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so um, um, I think if we had, uh, if we looked specifically at the correlation with the driving pressure, which I didn't show you the data on, and the, um, the compliance phenotypes, then you would see that the patients with stiffer lungs had a drop in driving pressure in response. Um, but, the, but what we're seeing overall is that you, the algorithm applies larger tidal volumes in patients with relatively preserved compliance and smaller tidal volumes in patients with stiffer lungs. Uh, and so the, 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 two, uh, the two sort of um, counteract each other to a certain degree to create no real difference, measure difference, although it's slightly lower in the ASV group. Um, but overall, the, even in the group that was receiving higher tidal volumes, the driving pressures were still in that safe range within that group. I see. I got you. I yep. got you. And, and so... It's really true that all the new, all the ventilators you see around uh, with ASV, they are using this formula. Um, I believe so. I, I can't say with with certainty, but um, but it, the, that is the it is the sort of that's the algorithm that's supposed to be used now. Um, I think um, uh, historically one of the one of the uh, issues that people had with it, even though they liked the algorithm, was that concern for higher tidal volumes in this new algorithm that applies the Mead equation in addition to the Otis equation. Um, was, was in, introduced in order to really uh, address that concern. Thank you very much.